Hello and thank you for joining us for today's video. But before we start, we want to show you a short clip from our video, Three Paranormal Love Stories, from our new channel, Paranormally Listed. There will be a link to the full video at the end of this video. One day she came across a Bigfoot eating the buds off her plants. Initially she wanted to run because she was afraid of him. But she decided to stand her ground because that crop was her livelihood. So she pointed her shotgun at the Bigfoot. The Bigfoot put his hands in the air. Then Nancy looked down and saw Bigfoot's genitals. It was clear that he was sexually aroused. Nancy said it had been a while since she had sex and she was impressed with Bigfoot's penis. Nancy said that she's not sure what happened next, but it turned into an adult movie. She said she didn't know who started it, but he ended up having sex with her from behind. But before we start today's video, we want to bring you a word from one of our favorite sponsors, Raid Shadow Legends. You may be wondering, why is Raid one of my favorite sponsors? Because with awesome global PvP battles, massive PvE boss battles, and over 600 champions, it's my favorite RPG and I love playing it. Today I want to talk about one of my favorite bosses, Guardian of the Void, Malak Havar. While stargazing one night, Malak, who was a priest, had an epiphany. For light to exist, it needs darkness. This newfound philosophy angered the other priests and he was expelled. But lucky for us, he mastered the magic of the void and this gave us a great supply of void potions to ascend our heroes with. When you're fighting Malak, it's best to deal with all the poison he puts out. To do that, you'll need shield buffs, healing to counteract the damage, or the ability to remove debuffs directly and often. If not, your whole team could be wiped out. But if you can cleanse the buffs, then you're set, because he doesn't have many other weapons. Another reason Raid is great is because they always have something new going on. This month they have a ton of events and tournaments that happen every single day. You can also win this brand new legendary hero, Krado Fox Hunter. Plus they have a fresh rotation of the brutal Hydra boss. This is the best time to get started in Raid. If you click on my link in the description or scan my QR code here on the screen, you'll get cool bonuses. We're talking a free epic champion, Burgess, 200,000 silver, 1 energy refill, 1 experience boost, and 1 ancient shard so you can summon an awesome champion as soon as you get in the game. All this treasure will be waiting for you here. Once you're in, you can find me in the game under the name C listed, and if you're fast, you can join my clan. It's that easy. Just click on the link in the description or scan the QR code and I'll see you in the game. Number 3. Gary Miller In the summer of 1999, 43-year-old Gary Miller lived in Comer Township, Pennsylvania. Miller had never been married. He lived with his mother and stepfather. He had two jobs. He was the night manager of a grocery store in Wyoming, Pennsylvania, and he was a gospel music concert promoter. On August 6, 1999, Miller worked the late shift at the grocery store. Afterward, Miller and a co-worker went out for dinner at a local diner. They finished at about 1 a.m. and Miller got into his car. His co-worker noticed that when he pulled out of the parking lot, he drove in the opposite direction of his home. She thought it was strange, but didn't think much of it. Where Miller went is unknown. What is known is that he returned to the area about 45 minutes later. He parked his car in the parking lot of an adult bookstore that was open 24 hours a day. In the parking lot, someone approached his car and shot him several times, including once through the heart. Miller tried to drive away, but he only made it about 65 feet before going through a fence and then colliding with a tree. His body was found minutes after the shooting. The murder shocked the community. Gary Miller was a down-to-earth man whose passion was gospel music. Miller seemed like the last person to be shot to death in the parking lot of an adult bookstore. The police investigated the murder and they learned that Miller believed he was being stalked. Two weeks before the murder, Miller told his mother that he thought he was being watched. Miller also mentioned to a friend that he suspected that he was going to be blackmailed soon. 
but Miller never explained why he thought he was going to be blackmailed or what he was going to be blackmailed over. A week before the murder, Miller's mother heard him having an odd conversation on the phone. He said to the caller, if they are right with the Lord, they don't have to be afraid to die. His mother never learned who he was speaking on the phone with. On the night Miller was murdered, Miller received two calls at work that unsettled him. After one call, his co-worker said he slammed the phone down and then he swore, which was extremely out of character. A short time later, another co-worker heard Miller talking on the phone. Miller asked the caller to come to the grocery store to speak with him. The caller didn't want to do this. The co-worker couldn't hear the other side of the call, but he made out that Miller agreed to meet the caller that night at a location the caller suggested. The police believed that the caller was either the killer or was working with the killer. During the second call, the caller most likely directed Miller to the parking lot where he was murdered. Unfortunately, the police have no leads in the case. The police do not know why Miller was stalked and harassed before his murder, but they believe it's connected to his murder. A few years after Miller's murder, the Yellow Bookstore where he was killed was demolished. Miller's mother died in August 2009 without knowing who killed her son. Nearly 23 years after Gary Miller's murder, the case is hopelessly cold. The rest of the family and friends of the gospel music loving man are hoping that his murder will eventually be solved. Number 2. Mario Lindsay Mario Lindsay was born in January 1956 in Vancouver, British Columbia. She grew up in an exclusive area of Vancouver with her brother, Kent. Their father, Eric, was a celebrity photographer with the newspaper, The Vancouver Sun, and their mother, Marjorie, was a homemaker. In the late 1960s, the Lindsay family moved to Toronto, Ontario, because Eric got a job with the CBC, Canada's national public broadcaster. About two years after the move, Eric and Marjorie split up. Marjorie and Ken moved back to Vancouver, while Eric and Mariel stayed in the Toronto area. When Mariel was 18, her mental health deteriorated. She eventually had a nervous breakdown, and she was diagnosed as borderline psychotic. After that, she moved back to Vancouver to live with her mother. In Vancouver, her mental health improved. In 1983, when Mariel was 27 years old, she rented a two-bedroom apartment in a heritage house on a block called Mole Hill. According to Mole Hill's website, it is the last surviving block of pre-First World War housing stock in Vancouver, the most significant example of Vancouver's Victorian and Edwardian era domestic architecture. The block has 30 heritage-listed properties built between 1888 and 1908, providing a direct link to the earliest days of the city of Vancouver. About 10 years after moving back to Vancouver, Mariel got a job with the Postal Service as a letter sorter. In early 1995, Mariel was diagnosed with a severe illness. She got chemotherapy and lost her hair. Mariel was a very private person and she did not tell anyone at work that she was ill. She would go to her chemotherapy appointments alone. To hide her hair loss from her co-workers, she would wear a backward baseball cap. After a year of treatment, she beat the disease and had a clean bill of health. In late 1995, around the time that her health was improving, Mariel told several co-workers that she thought she was being stalked. It started when one of her two cats disappeared. Mariel hung out flyers around the neighborhood looking for information about the cat and didn't include her phone number, but not her address. Then one day she found a note that had been slipped under the door of her apartment. It said she owed money for some vet bills. Mariel told her brother that she thought that someone had stolen her cat. 
the cat, was never found. Mario was so disturbed by the incident that she made a report with the police. Mario then began to receive strange anonymous letters. Then other strange things happened. Someone signed her up for a six month subscription to the Vancouver Sun. Then two magazine subscriptions were taken out in her name. Also, someone made a $120 donation in her name to the United Way. All these were paid for using Mario's credit card. Once again, Mariel made a police report. One day, Mariel's father, Eric, was visiting her and something strange happened. They were walking back to her apartment from Stanley Park. Suddenly, Mariel started running. Eric saw an older, gray-haired man running after Mariel, calling her name. Eric asked Mariel about the incident and she convinced him it was nothing. Sometime later, Mariel wrote to Eric that she complained about her landlord and two men who ate dinner with her on Sunday nights. Both men lived in apartments in the house. One man, only identified as Juan, was from Mexico. The other man, only identified as Jerry, lived in the apartment above Mariel. Mariel thought that the men somehow got a hold of the key to her apartment and they made a copy of it. She thought that they stole a pair of her jeans. One night, the door to her apartment opened at 3 a.m. She looked out the door and saw Juan walking down the stairs. She said she would get a new lock put in and she would not give a copy of the key to the landlord. Mario continued to get anonymous letters and they got to be so bad that she had her mail forwarded to her mother. Mariel also decided it was time to move. In early 1996, she found a nice apartment and she was set to move at the end of February 1996. In the last week of January 1996, Mariel's mother, Marjorie, received a disturbing letter addressed to Mariel. It reads, Hi scum, you are now 40. We hope and pray you start acting like an adult and not like a teenager. We hope you stop smoking. You stink. Marjorie didn't want to tell Mariel about the letter because she thought it would upset her. She discussed the letter with her ex-husband, Eric, and he agreed it was best not to tell Mariel about the letter. On February 16, 1996, Mariel worked a regular afternoon shift at the mail sorting facility. Then she and a co-worker walked through downtown to the West End where they both lived. They parted ways at a hospital that was two blocks from Mariel's apartment. This is where they commonly split up. The next day, Marjorie became concerned when Mariel didn't call her. Mariel called her every day. Marjorie and a friend decided to go check on Mariel. The landlord unlocked the door to her apartment. Marjorie had to push hard against the door because something was blocking it. It turned out to be the body of her 40-year-old daughter. Muriel had been bludgeoned to death. She had been struck several times on the head and in the larynx. If a weapon was used, the police do not know what that weapon was, or if they do know, they have never made that information public. The police believe that Muriel was killed shortly after returning home from work. She was wearing the same clothes she was wearing when she left work. The police thought that the killer may have been waiting inside the apartment for her. The police interviewed the neighbors and no one heard anything unusual. The police went back to the apartment a few days after the body was found to do some more investigating. A detective heard a strange sound coming from behind the refrigerator. It turned out to be Muriel's cat, not the one who went missing months earlier. The police do not believe that the cat could have gone behind the fridge by itself, so they think that the killer put it there. Not long after the murder, Juan returned to Mexico. According to Eve Lazarus's podcast, Cold Case Canada, Mariel's father, Eric, believes that Juan killed his daughter. Eric said that Mariel told her that Juan had threatened to kill her. 
Also, Juan and Jerry harassed her in different ways. He wanted to report the threats to the police, but Mario convinced him not to. Eric said that since Juan lived in the building, he probably knew Mario's routine. On the night of the murder, Jerry was having a party. So Juan knew he could attack Mario that night and the sounds of the murder would have been drowned out. Also, apparently, before Juan moved out, he made sure he wiped down his apartment and left no fingerprints behind. Eric believes that his daughter learned something about Juan that he didn't want her to know. Juan didn't want her to move away because he might not have been able to keep her quiet, so he decided to kill her. The police said they have investigated all angles regarding Mariel's murder. They believe that the stalking is connected to the murder. They have said that Juan is a suspect, but they are investigating other angles. However, the police have never made much progress in the case. It's been 26 years since Meryl Lindsay was murdered, and no one has ever been arrested in the case. Her friends and family are still hoping that the killer will be brought to justice. Number 1. Sharon Lee Gallegos In the summer of 1960, 4-year-old Sharon Lee Gallegos and her family lived in Alamogordo, New Mexico. Sharon had a brother and a sister. Their 30-year-old mother, Lupe, was raising all three of them by herself. She supported the family by working at a local motel. At 2.55 p.m. on July 21, 1960, four-year-old Sharon and her brother Johnny were playing in an alley behind their home. As they played, a woman came up to them and offered to buy Sharon candy and clothes if she got into her car. Sharon said no, but the woman grabbed her and dragged her into the car. Lube's sister, Beatrice, was in the kitchen and she heard the commotion. She looked out the window and saw the car driving away. Beatrice grabbed the car keys and wanted to give chase, but she remembered that she didn't know how to drive. Instead, she ran outside and flagged down a car. She asked the driver to follow the car, but when she went to point out the car, it had vanished. The police were called and roadblocks were set up, but the car wasn't found. Several people described the car as a dirty old green car. Beatrice thought it was possibly a 1951 or 52 Dodge. The woman was described as blonde, heavy set, and she was wearing glasses. The car was driven by a white man described as tall, thin, with blonde or light hair that was combed back. His most notable feature was a long, sharp nose. It turned out that people had seen the same woman in the neighborhood stalking Sharon and her family for at least a week. About a week before the kidnapping, the woman talked to a neighbor of the Glagos. She pointed out the family's home and asked if Lupe lived there. She wanted to know if Lupe had a little girl. She then asked if Lupe had a lot of children. She also asked if anyone else lived in the house or if it was just Lupe and her children. The neighbor noticed that the woman had two kids in her car. One was a girl and the other was a boy with freckles. Over the next week, several people saw the green car in the neighborhood. On the day of the kidnapping, two family friends were at the Glagos home, 16-year-old Mary Lou Badiol and 11-year-old Dolores Badiol. They noticed the green car parked outside and saw the woman watching the house. Normally, Sharon liked to go to the nearby grocery store on her own. But on that day, when Lupe asked Sharon to go buy some cats up, she didn't want to go by herself. So 11-year-old Dolores went with her. When they got close to the green car, Sharon became afraid and would not go by it without being picked up and carried. So Dolores picked her up and carried her past the car. In the hours and the days after the kidnapping, no clues were found as to what happened to four-year-old Sharon. The FBI was called in, but despite their help, not much progress was made on the case. 
The police initially thought that Sharon's father may have been involved in the kidnapping. He had abandoned Lupe before Sharon was born and never shown any interest in Sharon. So he was quickly ruled out as a suspect. On July 31st, 1960, nine days after the kidnapping, the body of a young girl was found partially buried in a creek bed near Congress, Arizona. Congress is about 540 miles from Alamogordo. Initially, it was believed that it was Sharon's body, but experts determined that it was not Sharon's body. They believe that the girl who was found was older than Sharon. Also, the girl's footprints didn't match Sharon's footprints. Sadly, the young girl found near Congress has never been identified. She has the depressing title of Little Miss Nobody. Due to the state of decomposition, the cause of death has never been determined, but it's believed she was murdered. It's believed that she was between the ages of 5 and 7. She had brown hair that was possibly tinted or dyed auburn. She was 3 foot 6 to 4 foot 5 and weighed somewhere between 50 and 60 pounds. She had a full set of children's teeth that were in excellent condition. On January 12, 1961, six-year-old Rosemary Riddle was kidnapped from a migrant work camp in Kern County, California by a pregnant woman. She was lured into a car that a man was driving. Someone who saw Rose get into the car recognized the driver. He was 30-year-old Richard Arlen Lindsay, who sometimes lived at the camp. So the police were on the lookout for Richard and his car. It was located on January 15, 1961, three days after the kidnapping. Sleeping inside the car was 30-year-old Richard Lindsay and his 26-year-old wife, Dixie Lindsay. Dixie was seven months pregnant. Inside the car, the police found dried blood. The police took Richard and Dixie into custody, and they both confessed to murdering Rose. They were driving around on the afternoon of January 12th, and Richard said he wanted a young girl for sexual purposes. So they went to the labor camp, and they lured Rose into the car. Richard raped and choked her in the back seat of the car, and they thought she was dead. They dumped her on the side of the road. But then Dixie noticed she was still alive. So she got the tire iron out of the car and beat her in the head. Dixie led the police to the body of Rose. Richard and Dixie were both charged with murder. The police thought that Richard and Dixie may have been the couple who kidnapped Sharon. There were similarities between the crimes, specifically a couple kidnapped a young girl. Also, Richard and Dixie had several physical features that were similar to the kidnappers. Dixie was described as a short, heavy-set woman, and Richard had a long, sharp nose. Richard also had hair that was combed back. The couple was initially from Texas, but traveled around the Southwest because Richard was a migrant worker. The couple also had three other children. The police showed photos of the couple to Sharon's aunt, Beatrice, and her brother, Johnny. But neither of them could confirm if they were the couple who kidnapped Sharon. The authorities could not find any evidence that connected the couple to Sharon's kidnapping, or find any evidence that even proved they were in the state when she was snatched. Richard pleaded guilty to the murder of Rosemary Riddle a few days after he was arrested. He was sentenced to death. He was executed via the gas chamber 11 months later on November 14, 1961. Dixie originally pleaded not guilty. She gave birth to her fourth child while awaiting trial. She went to trial in May 1961. Mid trial, she changed her plea to guilty and she was sentenced to life in prison. It's unclear what happened to Dixie after she was sentenced to life in prison. She is no longer registered in the California inmate database, so she was either released or she died in prison. If she is alive today, she will be 84 years old. Tragically, Sharon Lee Gallegos has never been found dead or alive. 
If she is still alive at the time of this video, she will be 66 years old. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Don't forget to check out our new channel, Paranormally Listed. There's a link on the screen now.